Welcome to the Hero Value video blog. Today I'm going to be talking about the idea of the public in debates about the public value of arts and humanities research. Because in studying those debates, I can't be help be struck by how often the notion of the public crops up. But as Stefan Collini points out in his recent volume, very eloquently, these publics almost, almost always appear as a taxpayer who's only concerned with their money being spent as efficiently and transparently as possible. And that kind of public is greatly removed from the real publics that academics are continually encountering in their process of creating knowledge. So what I want to argue in my contribution today is that before we can start to talk about public value in a meaningful way, we have to have a better understanding of who these publics are and what they really want to get out of research beyond knowing that their tax dollars are being well spent. So I think it's interesting to start to think about how this grad grind public actually emerged. The idea of some kind of lumpen public used to justify policy measures isn't novel. The idea of the people and the proletariat have been used in a range of reactionary and revolutionary circumstances to underpin and claim legitimacy for a, a wide range of political platforms that often have very little to do with the interests of the people. But the hallmark of the post-war democratic consensus was there was a differentiated public, and this could be incorporated by engaging with a range of representative organizations. Those groups had at their peak political parties who had a membership in mind, who they negotiated on, created policies for, and through their membership had at least a notional degree of accountability and representative involvement. Of course, what has happened with this settlement is that it's become increasingly fragmented. Representative networks have declined, political party membership has fallen, and the idea of the citizen as a consumer has emerged to fill the gap that has been left. Now this notion of the citizen as consumer has inf greatly influenced the way science policy has emerged in the last 20 years. Science policy has justified itself through its ability to create gro uh, growth and prosperity for consumers. Consequently, science policy should be managed in the name of efficiency and accountability to this consumer citizen. Now, at the same time, we've seen a change in the way that the business of research is carried out. There's been a huge inflow of resources into research activity, a massification of public expenditure. This has allowed new kinds of research to be taken on, new norms of doing research. So research in increasingly large teams and international networks using expensive infrastructures. But this additional funding has brought with it a new social compact, an agreement with society that research funding is expected to contribute specifically to public development, to particular public policy goals, but also to dealing with the grand challenges that societies face. This massification has meant that governments have increasingly had to turn to proxy measures to manage their national research portfolio. So we see review of performance through increasing use of metrics rather than peer review partly because of the size of the evaluation task. There is a huge amount of research now needing to be evaluated, but also because of this idea of efficiency. Governments want to know which is the most effective and then to invest more resources in it. Now, as part of this, as part particularly around the new societal compact, has been the rise of the fetish cult of innovation. The idea that research, research policy at least, should specifically be targeting driving innovation. As a result, the idea is research policy, research investment will lead economic growth, job creation, and ultimately wider societal prosperity, furthering the interest of the citizen consumer. So if one looks at publications from research councils across Europe, here it's examples from three countries, they are saying explicitly that good research is not just research that is academically excellent, as judged by its peer community, but research that drives innovation and creates public value. But it's important to point out that in this macro model of how research drives growth, there's been an elision here in understanding how that process works. Now, it's true 
that for some research, there's an almost linear transformation from research activities leading to an idea that inspires a new product that creates sales, jobs, growth. That can be seen most explicitly in the pharmaceutical industry. Patenting there is common, creating a, a product, an idea that can then be passed to a small firm to develop, sold to a multinational that creates jobs. But it seems to me to be a mighty logical leap to say that that very specific model is a good, adequate way of understanding how all research benefits society. And in particular, this policy concept of the way that research adds value seems to rely on the sense that there is a, that there is a notion of social progress that is undisputed. We can all agree that under more or less all circumstances, creating jobs is a good thing. There are certain caveats that I'll mention later. But what we don't agree on is areas of social progress. So an extreme example might be to one group, they might think that social progress is better integrated housing and transport. To another group, it might be precisely separation that they value. So my argument is that part of the problem is a poor definition of what is the social progress that public research should be working towards. Now, partly this arises because of the very messiness in the way that publics encounter humanities research. It would be nice if there was a simple researcher transmission reception behavior change impact, causal chain, as there is arguably in the pharmaceutical industry. The reality of humanities research is that publics crop up at many points in the process. The journey by which research creates impact is a long one, and it's intermediated by many users, not all of whom are academic or end users. Now, there can be clear examples of direct relationships. For example, when academics bring their research into the media and they launch books that generate sales. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have research that contributes to a debate, that influences a community, for example, lawyers. And then the lawyers are part of a system of regulation of the Constitution that ultimately changes the way that governments behave, and that influences societal well-being. Now, this, the point of this, these lengthy chains, means that there are many publics, and they don't even necessarily agree on what progress is in a way that you could measure progress. They don't even agree in a way that allows you to judge whether impacts are substantial contributions to that progress. Now, when the issue is that there are many different factors that influence the way that humanities research creates social value. The pathways of knowledge flow are very diffuse. In contrast to uh, having clearly identified recipients and beneficiaries, for example, in the pharmaceutical sector, the the way that arts and humanities research might be transmitted might not even encounter a transaction. So there might, you might not have pills being sold. You might have books being sold. But in the case of a lawyer of communities who changed the constitution, that could potentially benefit a whole population in very marginal ways that are very difficult to measure. Even for those who read a book, the contrast with someone who takes a pill, the scientific tests show you what the benefits of taking that pill are. But nobody knows really what the 65,000 people that read a book about medieval history actually take away from that and the benefits that they derive from that. Ultimately, there are many connections of arts and humanities research into society, but counting them and measuring them is almost impossible. Taken with the fact that researchers also feel a, a, a huge pressure to justify themselves in economic terms leads to a reinforcement of this idea of citizen as consumer that leads to a, f a misunderstanding of what it is that publics really do value about uh, arts and humanities research. Now, what we can see is that clearly in the valorization process, this idea that growth is good is not the only public value that is expressed in the way that a piece of intellectual property flows to market. The public values are internalized throughout the valorization system, even in the case of a pharmaceutical firm. I mentioned previously the, this notion that the creating jobs is a good thing. But there is a caveat 
that we can say, well, we don't believe that if those jobs are hazardous or dangerous or demeaning. If they lead to the creation of new industries that produce huge amounts of pollution, then there is much less public support for the ideas that creating those jobs is good. So we see, for example, the, the, a shift in the nature of the research in the energy technology around coal related to acid rain problems emerging in the 1980s, the death of forests, that ultimately the public expressed a view about directions that research should take in its use. Every step in the valorization process is regulated in some way, according to a set of principles through which public values are expressed. So university research reflects a belief that it is socially useful to invest in particular activities, research, that the market systematically underinvests in. So governments provide subsidy, therefore breaking the belief in the free market, but out of a wider public value for these collective goods being provided. The patenting stage is an interesting one because the public value there is very contentious. A patent is a monopoly directly counter to the ideas of free market wealth creation. It's a temporary private monopoly on exploiting knowledge. It leads to higher prices in the shorter term for customers. Nevertheless, the si patent systems reflect public values that that temporary cost, the higher prices, is worth it to provide an incentive to innovators to, in to invest in research and development and create new products. So the question becomes, noting that there are a range of public values involved in the valorization process, that this valorization process is very complex for the humanities, there is no consensus around what could contribute to public development, social development, how can we start to think about where public value lies? Now, I want to frame that question in terms of a concept developed by uh, Bozeman, Barry Bozeman, the idea of public value failure. Now this I think is quite useful because we're all familiar with the idea of a market failure. Perfect competition may lead to suboptimal welfare results as a possible outcome of the pursuit of competition. A monopoly is a market failure, suboptimal, but it can arise through competition. If the, if the competition is so murderous that at the end there is only one company left, then that company despite having competed strongly, is free to raise its prices and exploit the monopoly situation. Now, the idea of public failure takes this line of argument one step further. Sometimes public policies can lead to outcomes which are market optimal or create a, the best set of private benefits, but at the same time breach public values. So we can see in science policy there are a range of areas where the public value failures are evident that, and this identifying where those value failures take place give a sense of how the public actually values research. Although the way that the public, yeah, the way that public values come to play on the prosecution of research. So in research policy, there is always the risk that a narrow emphasis on economistic benefits creates a situation that breaches public value. A mismatch between narrow, measurable version of social development, GDP growth, for example, and what publics actually really expect from their research. So Bozeman and Sarowitz created a typology of how public value failures might emerge, the processes that produce them, leading to situations where narrow interests are being served, and yet the public value is being transcended. So we talked about the patenting system as a temporary monopoly that's necessary to fund R&D to give rewards to those that invest it. But we know that strategic patenting takes place. Owners of patents use their patents not to generate a return and incentivize their past knowledge creation, but to stop their competitors competing effectively with them, to block competitors' progress, thereby blocking societal progress as a whole. Even though it can make sense for the individual firm to do that, the net result of that system functioning is something that is less than optimal for society. Now, one, one of Bozeman and Sarowitz's archetypes is that a public value failure may arise when policy progress 
and social cohesion are insufficient to ensure that there is an effective command progressing of public values. Clearly, this is something that uh, can exist in the case of science policy, notoriously dominated by elites, with dependent on principal agent relations, game playing by agents. It does seem to be a prima facie case here that the policy process has failed to take into account what matters to the public, what the public value in its valorization policy. So my argument at this point is that at least some resolution of the question of what counts as social progress could come through attempting to understand the governance systems by which humanities research is, is regulated as it flows into society and the public values that are expressed there as a reflection of the broader views in what public wants from its research. Now, part of the problem with the governance and regulation of humanities research is that the process, as we've seen, it's diffuse, it's ubiquitous, it comes into play in many different arenas, it incorporates many kinds of values, from ideas of defamation in publication, public interest broadcasting in the media, from the idea of the democracy of science. But at the same time, there are very clear examples of where the public makes its opinions known. The public do not tolerate scientific fraud. In the Netherlands, we saw very recently the case of Professor Stapel, from the University of Tilburg, who simply invented research data. Now, that story created a huge amount of public interest. When one follows the case in the media, there was so much comment being produced that the university had to respond very thoroughly, commission independent require, inquiry. That inquiry has likewise generated media coverage. Clearly, there was a public appetite to know more about, about the case, but also to understand that the case was being properly dealt with by the authorities. That is a very clear example of where public values can be expressed. At the other end of the spectrum, again here in the Netherlands, there can be uh, controversial humanities research where the, the public value is almost against that research being undertaken. So recent research declared that one party here in the Netherlands was a fascist party. Now that was a party that attracted 16% of the popular vote in the last election. So clearly there is a sense that it is challenging the, it, the research is almost setting itself up against the public values, or the values of the public. Now, taking a step back to the, the starting point of that, I said what's interesting in debates about research valorization is that there's no attempt to let the publics really have a say about what matters to them. There's, ten there's a tendency to use particular signaling activities as a proxy for the way that publics view research. So it, if you buy a book that's been written by a researcher, that signals that you have an interest in that piece of research. When we look at the issue of public values in valorization, this appears to be looking at it, framing the problem in entirely the wrong way. The issue that jobs is a good measure, we've already seen, isn't entirely um, a stable value measure. The fact that there is a settled consensus means that only certain types of jobs are worth creating. But certainly jobs that may arise from a temporary creation, a temporary use of the uh, monopoly on knowledge. So there are always public values being expressed in the way that research is being valorized. So the issue then for humanities research is trying to understand how the public express a view about research how publics try to engage with, regulate, not necessarily the research itself, which is always dangerous, but the various ways in that which that research flows into society. Not as a direct measure of value, but a measure of the values that they have for the use of that research. In some areas, of course, that's relatively easy to, to follow. So the, the, the public has expressed through defamation laws, for example, a view on what counts as or what they value in terms of media representation. So honest, legal, fair, truthful. At the same time, other areas, particularly around cultural inclusion and national security, are more contested. This raises the question of, are all contributions made by research to these debates good? But fundamentally, what do the public think about that? And how do we hear the public's voice? And for me, this is the missing voice in this debate. What do the public think? 
where are the public getting worked up about humanities research in a way that they got up, worked up about uh, energy research in the 1980s, genetically modified food in the 1990s and 2000s. And when we look at those arenas, you get a sense of what matters, what the public want to achieve with research, and that gives a frame for what researchers and uh, governments themselves should be promoting. So where are those arenas where the public are engaging with research and attempting to control it? That, I think, is a critical question. And answering that question is vital to having a more sensible discussion about what matters about the public value of research and getting beyond a value failure that ultimately betrays the public value to a very narrow reading of what ultimately matters about research. Thank you.